Hello, everyone. My name is Hope Hornbeck. Um, I am Manzanita Botanical Consulting, and um, this presentation is uh, a summary of the recent evaluation of current and future threats to Utah's five listed cactus species. From 2019 through 2020, I worked with Fish and Wildlife Service on a project to quantify recovery criteria for Utah's five threatened and endangered cactus species, which includes two pediocactus, pediocactus despainii and pediocactus winkleri, um, and three sclerocactus species, sclerocactus brevispinus, <clears throat> sclerocactus wetlandicus, and sclerocactus radii. Uh, the image on the right, that map shows the generalized distributions of those five cacti uh, with Sclerocactus brevispinus and wetlandicus in the Uwana Basin in the upper right, and the two pediocacti um, with Despainii having the largest distribution, those scattered within that, and Sclerocactus, winkleri, Sclerocactus ridei and Pediocactus winkleri uh, within that. And the following slides, I'll, I'll summarize our data sources, the life history traits of these species, and key results. There are multiple threats to U Utah's listed cactus species, um, the main ones being limited distributions, livestock trampling, including feral horses, off-road vehicles, and dispersed recreation, illegal collection, though that seems to have dropped off recently, but still a concern, oil and gas development, invasive species, and of course, global climate change. Most of these threats cannot be quantified with the currently available data, so the focus of the analyses that we worked on were on livestock and feral horse trampling and climate. Um, we also evaluated generalized threat scenarios to quantify potential impacts from these other sources, but um, I'm probably not going to have time to go into that today. Our data sources included um, two studies primarily um, from Capitol Reef National Park and the Uinta Basin. Um, in 2012, uh, I helped initiate range-wide monitoring in the Uinta Basin for Sclerocactus brevispinus and wetlandicus. Um, that, those, that study comprises 234 plots for Harriet cactus and 407 plots for Sclerocactus wetlandicus. The, the uh, information below this table shows how many um, actual individual genets that includes and how many observations. The Capital Reef data set uh, starts in 2013 and also includes a large number of plots um, within the park. Um, also at this point, I should define genet for our purposes, which is a individual plant comprised of one or more stems. Um, we had a number of assumptions based to uh, to use to determine what an individual is. Um, but our, our, for our purposes, a, a genet is an individual. Um, also, I should note that we did not have more than a single year's demographic data for Pediococcus dyspanii. Um, that study in the Wedge Overlook is ongoing, but we did not have demographic data to work with. So all four of the species analyzed have size-driven demography, which means that the uh, stem size determines their reproductive outputs. Uh, these four figures illustrate multinomial and linear regressions of plant size um, by number of reproductive structures, being buds, flowers, and fruits. Um, in all four cases, these relationships were significant. So our demographic models are size-based. Um, we used a genet size-based demographic model illustrated in this figure. Uh, a genet is the sum diameter of all of its stems. Again, this could be one to many. And we define four size classes for each of the species. Um, in all cases, size class one is a seedling or juvenile plant. Um, and size classes two to four represent adult potentially reproductive, but not always reproductive plants. And the size class boundaries were roughly defined based on minimum size at flowering and natural boundaries in the number of reproductive structures produced, um, where numbers of reproductive structures generally increase uh, in genet size classes two, three, and four, but in some cases may drop off in larger, um, somewhat decadent plants in genet size class four. So this model shows 
um, the relationship between <clears throat> the genet size classes and stasis illustrated by an S, growth, which is G, retrogression or shrinkage, which is the R's, the backward pointing arrows, and fecundity, which is the F, the, the arching arrows over the top of the figure. Stasis is an individual that stays the same size from one year to the next. So what this illustrates, this figure generally illustrates the probability of an individual staying the same size, growing to another size class, retrogressing to a smaller size class, and producing offspring in the next year. The figure below the demographic model illustrates our matrix population model with n to the t, which is the number of individuals in each size class at our first year of observation, multiplied by a matrix of these transition probabilities, which through some fancy math in a black box gives us the number of individuals in n to the t plus one, which is the following year. So we have a uh, number of models that we, we produced using this matrix um, formula. We use different data sets to analyze threats. So we use the full observed data sets as well as treatment data sets. And in all cases, our data sets did not have any individuals or populations that represented a true control condition where there was an absence of man-made threats, um, particularly livestock grazing um, in both Capitol Reef and in the Uinta Basin. So we had to create post hoc control data sets uh, where we had um, data sets comprised of individual genets that at no time during the study period were observed to have been trampled or damaged by livestock or feral horses. And then we also created a post hoc livestock trampling data set of individuals that were observed at any time during the observation period to have been damaged or trampled. Um, we also had some cases where individuals were trampled by, for, uh, by ungulates, native ungulates, particularly in Capitol Reef. Um, in some cases it was elk or deer um, or unknown. And also there was an instance of some moth predation, um, moth larva predation on Sclerocactus radii in particular in Capitol Reef. So those observations were removed from the post hoc control and livestock trampling data set. We also evaluated dry average and wet climate years. Um, we used data from the PRISM data set online available from, uh, uh, from Oregon um, State University and the Western Regional Climate Center data for uh, both Capitol Reef National Park and in three different station locations in the Uinta Basin. And these data were organized by cactus year. Um, all four species roughly uh, have a demographic year that spans uh, July when, after seeds have been dispersed and the probability of seedlings being recruited to the, the next generation occurs to the following June. And for the most part, uh, monitoring has taken place in May and June for these species. So we have a cactus year that runs from 1st of July to through the end of June. Um, we compiled climate data for two years prior to the first observation for these data sets. And um, our analyses were based on post hoc control data sets to see really what relationships between climate and um, phyto rates actually are. So is population growth climate driven? Um, I evaluated a number of, um, a number of climate variables. Uh, really for temperature, I, I was using uh, monthly averages and, and didn't come up with a relationship, but total precipitation um, appears to have a rough relationship with, with population growth. Um, again, uh, these figures represent all four species with Pediocactus winkleri in the upper left and Sclerocactus radii in the lower right, and the two Uinta Basin cacti in the upper right and lower left, respectively. Um, it looks like there is a relationship. We really need longer term data. Um, it also appears that there's probably a one year lag in response, um, though in some cases it appears to occur in the same year. So there is a relationship with climate, particularly pre precipitation, but these are unlikely to be linear relationships and we really need to um, look at actual 
um, extreme events in addition to average conditions in these data sets. So we, we have some relationships, but, but there's mixed results. And there's some reasons for that. Uh, different vital rates um, respond differently to precipitation and temperature. Um, for example, a high precipitation event may increase seedling recruitment, as illustrated on the right, with some nice sheltered seedlings underneath the Sclerocactus wetlandicus. But it can also increase adult mortality due to increases in uh, herbivore populations um, and also just uh, a, a high rainfall event can cause cactus stems to uh, over imbibe and with water and actually split apart. Um, also, drought events can have mixed results um, can reduce fecundity while also increasing stasis and growth or, or retrogression rates that can contribute to population growth. So there's some mixed results and there's some recent studies that accept that, that that suggest that extremes are, are more important drivers than averages. So we need to look at this again. For livestock trampling, however, the, the effects are, are pretty clear. Um, again, these figures represent the four species analyzed with Pediocactus winkleri in the upper left and Sclerocactus ridii in the lower right and Periot cactus upper right and you want to base and hookless cactus in the lower left. Uh, these results are pretty consistent for, for these species. Um, we had different starting population size for our models and uh, some, some slightly different responses, but in general, it, these, these figures for a 20-year stochastic projection illustrate that really um, with increased trampling intensity, you're going to have cumulative downward effects in population growth rate. So our key results were that Utah's five listed cactus species are, are very similar in their morphology, physi physiology, and, and population behavior um, with, with a few, few differences. Um, all of these are, are relatively small, globose to cylindric, long-lived desert cacti. Um, they are presumably long-lived and uh, are capable of, of uh, surviving through long droughts and and climatic flux. Um, these species are all single to multi-stemmed individuals. All four species are capable of branching in response to stress. And uh, the growth or loss of, of branches um, facilitates long-term survival in the climates and, and conditions that they live in. When they're damaged, they're capable of producing new uh, branches from the, the surviving stem codex. They can also produce additional stems when the, when the uh, parent stem actually becomes, uh, is damaged or, or is decadent. Um, and they can in turn lose those branches or stems when conditions are no longer uh, favorable for, for a large um, biomass above ground. So the plant size for these species really drive survival and fecundity and thereby growth rate and for that reason, it is reasonable to assume that survival of the of populations and viability and resiliency in populations requires large resilient individuals. So year to year survival, stasis in the same size class or, or growth or retrogression even, but really largely just year to year survival, just remaining the same size from year to year, it makes the largest contributions to population growth rate in all four of these species. Um, Pediocactus winkleri tends to, to grow much more quickly than the Sclerocactus species, from what I can tell, um, but still stasis is the largest contributor to population growth rate. Um, precipitation pulses, of course, can, can contribute to increased population growth rates, but again, those results can be mixed. Um, but also, uh, Periodic drought is particularly for Sclerocactus brevispinus. This is a species that tends to just hang out in the same size from year to year. It's, it is a survivor. Um, again, livestock trampling effects were, have been consistent across all four species with all the analyses that we did. There's a linear negative response to increasing frequency and or intensity of livestock grazing. Um, livestock trampling, I should say. They don't eat the cactus, they just step on them. And there cum are cumulative changes in population structure and behavior with a downward shift in the contributions from the largest individuals to population growth with livestock trampling. 
and a uh, interestingly a ruderal response in sclerocactus wetlandicus where there can be um, high growth in seedling recruitment um, with probably due to competitive release and increased nutrient availability following a, a trampling event, but that response is short-lived. Um, we observed high growth following trampling events due to seedling recruitment, but because of the loss of large reproductive individuals, the um, population subsequently tanks a few years later. So recommendations and next steps moving forward. Um, I would like to evaluate additional methods using integral projection models that are our size-based um, models that do not have the arbitrary boundaries of size class. Perhaps some Bayesian methods to, to further sort out um, some of the uh, issues with the data sets and structural equation models um, to further evaluate in environmental variables. Um, also, I'm going to look at some climate extreme effects on, on population growth, looking at minimum and maximum monthly temperature uh, and, and precipitation events and seasonal extremes. And then uh, perhaps most importantly, really need to identify control or reference sites for each of these species and initiate some monitoring at those sites. Each species needs at least one control or reference and uh, because of, of the conditions in um, the Uinta Basin, we have no control or reference site. So that's something that we're working on. Uh, also, another consideration is perhaps to identify more widespread congeners like Sclerocactus parviflorus, where we might be able to, to more readily identify um, unperturbed populations and understand uh, what natural population growth and behavior looks like in the absence of livestock um, trampling. And then of course, we're continuing to refine monitoring methods at the existing sites. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to thank US Fish and Wildlife Service for the opportunity to participate in this project. Um, it has been very interesting. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me with any questions. Thank you so much.